Dr. Gary Goose, welcome back to the Nail the Ortho uh, show and the podcast. So happy to have you back on. And now we're going to talk a little bit of approaches, but welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be here. It's an honor. Yeah. And, and now we're going to talk and we can go ahead and just jump in and get into it. We're going to talk about the delta pectoral approach. And just really quickly, so what are some just some uses for the delta pec approach? You know, so I, you know sometimes it, that this may be uh, indicated to use this approach. Yeah, this is really the workhorse approach for all open shoulder surgery. Um, obviously, we have other approaches, but 95% of what you're going to do, you're going to work through the delta pectoral approach because it's an inner nervous plane. And so it allows us to access a lot of structure in the shoulder with, with minimal uh, morbidity. So fractures, arthroplasty, um, irrigation debridement, bicep tendinitis, just even certain anterior and anterior superior rotator cuff tears, pec repairs, on and on and on. All right. Well, without further ado, I know we have a video here. We can kind of just go into the approach and, and then while we're going through, we'll try to, to point out some key aspects, some key things and um, point out some key structure that everybody should know about. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and, and get this, uh, get this ball on the road here. Yeah. So the video you're going to see is a GoPro that was mounted on my head so that I try to keep my head pretty steady, but I do have to obviously move around to the surgery. This is a job. left shoulder. The patient is in the lazy beach chair position with the head of the bed elevated about 45 degrees. We make that incision from the coracoid to a point kind of in the mid humerus distally. Okay. And that's going to allow us to, um, to basically follow the delta pectoral interval. Then I, uh, this, this is approach is something I learned in my fellowship at the Rothman Institute. So all credit to, uh, to Dr. Jerry Williams, um, one of my mentors there. Uh, he would stick that cob under there and allow you to sort of bobby down onto the cob. And if you get it just right, you're going to protect that vein. It's kind of an easy way to get to the subcute tissues. Then yeah. we get hemostasis on both sides. Um, uh, infection research is, is something I'm, I'm interested in. And so we're very careful not to touch the skin with our gloves. We use these laps. And then after we're done getting that hemostasis, we actually uh, put those laps in the kick bucket so that they get off the field. Cause I, the P acnes or C acnes is in those deep dermal glands. That's another unique thing about shoulders is the unique uh, bacteria that live around it. So we, we do that. We kind of get nice hemostasis there. Yeah. Um, I think it's good to definitely note the, your technique for hemostasis. I remember the first time when I was doing some of these, I just kind of bovey everywhere, but instead, you know, you can find where it is, use your lab and then kind of we'll put a little pressure on that area and then show where you're trying to obtain some hemostasis. Well put. Some people will paint that, but you don't want to. That creates dead tissue. It kills all your, your healing cells. You want to just get where it's bleeding. So we put that Gelpy in there and an Army Navy up, or, up around the coracoid. We found and, that cephalic vein that's obviously going to be our interval. Um, so mm -hmm. working on the medial side of the vein to unroof it. Um, there are some differences of opinion there, but I think given most of the perforators are coming in off the deltoid, uh, that's a little bit easier. The downside is obviously you're always retracting against that vein. Right. And, and I realized uh, when I first was starting to do this, that I ended up always going too lateral with the approach and it's more medial than I, you know, I originally thought I'd end up between the heads of the deltoid and I'd be looking for the vein, <laughs> wondering where the vein is. That's um, a common yeah. error. And if you, if you go between the heads of the deltoid, you'll see that little raffe. Oh, then maybe they don't have a vein. And then what you're going to do is denervate the anterior deltoid. So you don't want to do that. I think as, as orthopedic surgeons, you know, we're used to the extremities and as we get closer to the chest and kind of up into the clavicle and neck, we're thinking that's not the area we usually operate. So, you know, keep in mind, if you are superficial, if you're superficial to that pec, it's very safe to go very medial. So as long as you're superficial to that muscular layer, you can and go medial. To, uh, absolutely. Right. Where you're describing. So, so this right here is find that interval. And if you need to unroof full thickness flaps to see where it is, it's really critical. Obesity, swelling, muscular patients, that's going to move the skin envelope and everything laterally. So the error is definitely to be lateral. So if you're having trouble, look medial, also look proximal. You can see where those meds and bumps are. If you can point out with your uh, laser pointer there, yep, right up approximately here. there's an area where the, the clavicular head of the pec and the deltoid sort of diverge. It's called Morenheim's fossa for a little trivia okay. for you there. The, cool. the apex of that is the uh, coracoid. And the uh, base of that triangle is the, um, is the clavicle, the bare area of the clavicle. So that's another area you can find it. So if you go proximal and medial, that's a good place to find your interval. Awesome. 
And, and just to do a quick recap right here, we're looking at the pec major, this long, obviously, uh, tubular structure, the cephalic vein, and then just lateral to that are the fibers of the deltoid. So let's, uh, let's keep going through this. Absolutely. And again, it's a left shoulder. You can see there often are crossing vessels that cross the interval. Uh, you'll typically see one up near the coracoid proximally. In fact, you can see where I'm kind of grabbing and bobbing in there. That's yeah. a very common vessel right where that coracoid is. There often can be one at the bottom of the interval too. So you want to watch for those because uh, those can bleed and be pesky. And you want to mobilize that vein enough so you're not having to, to be rough with it as you're retracting. Um, you know, it's a vein. And obviously, you want to protect it. And the more you dissect it out, um, you can sort of bobby down your finger here. If you put your finger superficial to the vein, that's a quick trick to get down distally. So once that's done, um, I really want to open up that interval. I use the two cob trick that uh, Dr. Williams taught me in fellowship. So pull that deltoid laterally and then sweep the pec off the conjoint mm -hmm. tendon, as you can see there, if I move my hand out of the way a little bit better. That's right um, here. Yeah, you want to be, you don't want to rake the muscle. You want to keep, you know, really respect the soft tissues. Now we're a little lateral where we're the, basically that's the pec tendon. And then I'm popping yeah. that under, right under the deltoid tendon. So right where the deltoid's coming to the humerus. If you are distal, can you pause it there for a second? Yeah. If you're distal to the top edge of the pectoralis major, you're going to be distal to the axillary nerve. And the nice thing about that is then when you put those retractors lateral, you're not worried that you're going to put it into the axillary nerve. So we're going to have one retractor there where the deltoid tendon comes in. We're going to stuff a sponge in there, A, because it's a bleeder that lives in there, uh, and B, it helps us kind of dissect out that, those adhesions to the humerus. We're going to find, so we're going to put a second yeah. helmet in the subacromal space. So I'm finding a CA ligament. I pop onto the ligament right here, that cob and then put a home in that layer. That's gonna define, you know, surgery is about working from known to unknown. So I've got my subacromial space and my deltoid. And now in the middle where the nerve lives and the rotator cuff, the things you wanna be careful about, you've sort of defined each edge, you can connect the dots. So what was that move? Um, you know, one thing, you, of course, you just said you they had that superior edge of the pec and then you put your home in over there and you found the CA ligament, got underneath it, put your home in over that. You just did a, a move with the arm uh, you changed the positioning of it. What, it, what, what were you changing the positioning for? And what was that advantage that it gave you? Yeah. A lot of shoulder surgery is about moving the arm. You see, we use a lot of arm holders. That's because the deltoid surrounds it and we can move the arm to relax the deltoid in a different position. So I abducted and internally rotated to relax that lateral deltoid. As I get okay. in under that sub deltoid and subacromal space, that really helps me. And then I just moved it again. And what you can see there is that humerus and cough will move. And the clavipectoral fascia and bursa will not. So you actually can just shake the humerus and kind of see the one tissue plane move onto the other. And that can let's, help you identify your appropriate oh, layer. Let's, let's bring that back one more time. I think that was definitely good to it's know. Kind of a, it's kind of a quick one there, but I just sort of wiggle the, yeah, so that, that little bleeder that's kind of lateral to the pack in between the mm -hmm. deltoid, I bobby that one if I need to. And then I'll just kind of shake the arm for a second here. This is, it's kind of a quick move. And it doesn't show it super well, but you can basically see where the scissors will kind of show there's a plane that moves and a plane that doesn't. And the clavipectoral fascia is in the same plane as the uh, conjoint tendon. That's sort of that superficial fascial layer. And then beneath that's the bursa. And those layers will not move. Deep to that is the cuff, which will slide. And that shows me exactly where I need to cut up to my C ligament right there. So all that you just cut was the clavipectoral fascia. Correct. And now Perfect. I just push the bursa posteriorly. Uh, similar to when people do total hips, some people will kind of, for posterior approach, some people excise it, some people just push the bursa away. Mm -hmm. I sort of just push it out of the way. Um, obviously, in under there, posteriorly is going to be my deltoid. So as long as I stay, I'm sorry, my axillary nerve, as long as I stay kind of anterior, I'm safe from that. If I get way, way, way back around the back, that's when I got to make sure I know where my uh, nerve is. And again, a little more of that adhesions from the bursa, and I can divide all, all that. Getting. Okay. Yeah. You want to be able to get your finger all the way from the subacromal space in through the subdeltoid space to the deltoid insertion. You got to, they have to have that fully cleaned out. That's really, really a critical first step. If you don't get that right, you're going to have a hard time right out of the gates. So that's, that's key. This is a Cobell retractor. It's a self-retaining retractor. I first put it in deep to the pec uh, medially and under the deltoid laterally, and it's superficial to conjoint. I'm going to release the top one centimeter of pec there just to kind of yeah. help me get a little lower. 
Then I'm so what's this tissue? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm dissecting just lateral to the conjoint tendon. So the lateral side of the conjoint is the safe side. The medial side is suicide because the medial side is obviously where all the plexus and axillary artery live. But laterally, you can dissect that tissue and allow you to get in under there to palpate your axillary nerve. So um, right deep to my scissors now is going to be the uh, three sisters. Yeah, that's your conjoint tendon. So right here's our conjoint tendon. That Again, beefy red stuff right part. where you are now is the short head of biceps. It's the lateral okay. most part of the chondroit tendon. Obviously, the corticobrachialis being the more medial portion of it. Right. Okay. So next, we're going to um, incise the clavipectoral fascia. You can kind of see that three sisters vessels are going to be kind of right under my scissors. I think we'll get a better picture of those in a bit. But uh, divide that all the way up to the C ligament. Now I'm going to take my self-retainer out. I'm putting my finger directly over the three sisters vessels, and I'm going to sweep up and down and feel that axillary nerve. So it's going to be okay. posterior to the conjoint, about to dive under the subscap. Laterally, I've got my other finger under the deltoid, and I'm feeling the nerve over there. And when it tugs over here, it should tug over there. This is called the tug test. So I want to feel the nerve, and I want to make sure that it's the axillary nerve, not some other nerve. Um, right. by making sure that it pulls on the side. That allows me to identify the nerve. I do that multiple times throughout the case. Um, once you get good at that, that becomes an extremely powerful tool. That's the three sisters vessels, also known as the anterior humeral circumflex. You yeah, see how releasing my pec right kind here. of allowed me to see those quite easily. Right. They run on These the vessels. interior edge of the pector of the uh, subscapularis. And this is all subscap up here. This mm -hmm. is pec right here. Humor yeah, why don't you outline, there. can you outline if you would, so the inferior edge of the subscap is where the pickups are and uh, right there. Correct. And then the superior edge, you can't really see, but up super. Yeah, sure. Something kind of like right around here ish. That's exactly right. And those are going to hit the arcuate artery and go up with the bicep. They're going to go under the biceps tendon actually. And then they're going to go up with the arcuate artery in the lateral side of the biceps tendon sheet, which is just like a centimeter lateral to your little line there. So it's going to be the biceps. You wouldn't know that by seeing it, but you could palpate it. And then where the superior line is the superior border, again, you'll be able to palpate that because above that is that rotator interval, right? Where there's right. supras Prime. coming up here, subscaps going down, and there's this triangular shaped interval, and you can really feel that little area. So again, it doesn't Trying look to this here, area. If you needed to palpate, it's quite easy to palpate, or you would just follow that bicep screw and biceps. that would show you the rotator interval. Yeah, because our, our super smash should be coming in somewhere up here, and, and this is that that space that's just right in between, you know, subscap, supersomatus, that's that interval area. That's well, exactly that squiggly lines are. Described. And through that <laughs> will course the, the biceps. So if you wanted to find the biceps distally and then follow it up, it would follow you right to it as we'll see in a bit. Good. That's exactly right. I love you using the tools. This is awesome. You know, <laughs> so let's continue on. We're going to cauterize these vessels. Some people will sew these off. Um, some people will put clips on them. I just cauterize them, but I do it carefully in a way that I make sure that I get them. What you don't want do to you... do is arc to your Cobell retractor. It is sort of touching the axillary nerve in two spots, right? So you don't want to put any, uh, thermal energy, electrical energy there. Now I'm going to find that now that I've found my nerves and vessels in external rotation, I'm going to internally rotate and get my biceps groove. You can see I'm lifting that biceps out of the groove. And all I do now, is quick question. Sort of do you do you always do the so I guess which at what point is you know because this is for a total shoulder arthroplasty but at what point are you saying like you know some of these tests you don't do with every um, with every delta pectoral approach you know for if you're fixing a fracture for example you may not uh, do the do a bicep synodesis so, so which which steps do you I guess would you say are okay these are more shoulder arthroplasty this is just the approach. Per se. That's a good point. So this is tailored toward shoulder arthroplasty. I'll try to point out as we go forward where it varies. So the three sisters vessels, we would not cauterize those unless we are taking the humeral head because those are part right. of the blood supply part of the humeral head. It's debated how much, but that's part of shoulder arthroplasty. The biceps tendon, we take the biceps tendon in a lot of open procedures, including some fractures and definitely all arthroplasty cases, but not every case. Um, this is a bicep tendesis to the pack. So again, this is specific for arthroplasty. If you were just doing a bicep tendinesis though, or doing it, if you felt like it was necessary for an ORF, you could do that then too. Ooh. The bicep tendon runs behind the pec major. So all we do is take two figure of eight sutures with like an ethabon or Tychron suture, some high tensile braided suture, and just 
sew it to the back of the pack. So we're going to open that. This patient in the video had had a biceps tenodesis at the mid groove level. So normally I would follow this all the way into the joint. You can see me palping the rotator interval. This one you can see later, there's kind of like an interference screw and the bicep sort of peters out halfway into there. But basically we would normally follow that biceps all the way into the groove. So here's me sewing that biceps to the pec. You want to sew from medial, proximal medial to distal lateral here, because as you get distal medial, you have your neurovascular bundles kind of coming through the axilla into the medial aspect of your arm. So if you had a big free needle and you went real medial and distal, that would not be a good thing to do. So we're going to tie that in place with the elbow and extension. And then I'm just going to excise that bicep tendon proximally. And you can see this bicep tendon. I think there's a little tendesis here. I think if I recall, you'll see like a little tendesis screw, this white screw. Here. There was, yes. I, I might have cropped, I might have uh, edited it out, but yeah, yeah, there was a screw that's like, yeah. So this, you know, again, normally we'd sort of follow this all the way up, but this, you know, sometimes these people have had prior procedures and this one's a little more scarred than usual. The, this, there's a, there's the interference screw, that white biocomposite yep. material. Typically, <laughs> uh, this does bleed a lot. Um, and that's one is. reason why we do the three sisters vessels first, if that's something we are going to do. Yeah, you can see that right there. You outlined it. So the technique I'm showing you here is an osteotomy. This is a lesser tuber oste osteotomy. So again, this is something for arthroplasty. You can either do a tenotomy, so cutting the tendon. You can do a peel, which means peeling the tendon directly off the bone. Or you can do the osteotomy. I like the osteotomy for anatomic arthroplasty. It... Um, you, you have, uh, you can monitor the healing post-operatively. You have right. bone, to bone healing, which is the strongest kind of healing you could have. Did you know that bone is the only tissue in the body that heals without scar, that the, oh, all really? the tissues have some scar, but histologically bone eventually will be indistinguishable from the original bone. That is why it's a, being an orthopedic surgeon is a fantastic profession. We're the only ones that <laughs> That's have very true. No scar tissue. So, so I Very like to true. take advantage of that. So we do that osteotomy. Oh, yeah. um, we're going to put sutures through there. A lot of people say, how do you aim that? You, you find that biceps groove as we showed. Um, you can sort of palpate the osteophytes medially kind of line that, or you can put something in the joint to show you where it is, but it should be kind of the size of like your thumbprint on there. So that, that does take a little, a little training to learn how to do that. But that, that's how we mobilize the subscap with the lesser tuberosity and continuity. Yeah. And I was going to say, so some do, or is there any advantage to some people dissecting the layers between subscap and the capsule? Or, you know, I know we're, I mean, we're obviously we're doing a lesser tuberosity, lesser tuberosity osteotomy here, but have you heard of any, any physicians that may try to dissect those two layers out? Or is that, you know, for, per a different technique? I, I have, in fact, I do that myself. Uh, that's okay. something that, uh, that I learned in fellowship and I feel very strongly about. I think the potential advantages are one, that tissue is pathologically contracted. We have shown in a couple articles, one in JSCS, um, that tissue has a lot of inflammatory and contractile mediators and is very much thickened. So normally if you do a scope, you know, you can see through that tissue, right? If you're doing like an instability procedure, when you excise this, it can be half an inch thick, three quarters of an inch thick. It's thousands of times thicker. It's also shorter and tighter. So I think it helps with post-op range of motion. I think it helps with mobilization of the subscap. So allowing, you know, it's part of your release. Just like if you're in a rotator cuff repair, you release those tight tissues. And then right. also it helps with exposure. You're getting that stuff out of there. You're helping mobilize the humor. So I'm a huge believer of the capsulectomy, um, something that we do a lot of research on and, and really are, are Happy to teach that anytime someone wants to move. The best way to do it is the plane you're seeing now is best found medial and distal. That's where the nerve is. So one of the reasons why you have to find the nerve, but we're going to slide that freer elevator in between the white capsule, which you can see where your pointer is yep, and the subscap right muscle. And I'm going to dissect that uh, muscle off. So again, from medial to lateral is most easy because the plane is more well-defined laterally I'm, going medial, lateral. Um, I'm sorry medially and then work your way laterally so again working from no no none so you see where the capsule is now i'm going to release that capsule off so the tissue yeah all this right here. Here. yeah you can see exactly so you see the osteotomy and the subscapper being peeled yep. immediately correct the capsule osteotomy. can you show the osteotomy bed there so you can right point here. out yeah so that's where the osteotomy came from 
you can see a arthritic humeral head above where the rotator interval yep. is, and then the capsule, the whole anterior inferior capsule, is still remaining attached to the to the anatomic neck. So we're yep. going to take that off there with kind of sweeps of a 15 blade. Perfect. Good. So then um, once that's done, that top edge will have somebody kind of pull that tendon forward. I'll push back on the humerus and then that can allow me to kind of get Mayo scissors to sort of get finish off that. that last little part medially. The superior aspect is a little bit blends more. Obviously, if in doubt, you know, leave the tissue with the, I don't want to excise any subscap. So if I have any doubt, I'll leave it on the subscap side. But usually that plane is very, very evident, even in revision settings. I'm also going to release the coracohumeral ligament at this point, um, which is what I just did there. And it didn't show it super well, but that was quick. That comes Let's from the lateral can... aspect of the coracoid to the rotator interval. And that's a sort of a tight band that can tether your subscap mobility. Right above my finger, above my scissors, is that right where you're exactly. That's the coracohumeral right ligament. There. It's a real structure. Um, I thought it was made up. And then <laughs> until... I there we go. It was. Yeah, boom. That's perfect. right here. And I'm just cutting that right there down to the rolled board of the subscap. Exactly. Perfect. Cool. And you do that with every case. The cortical humeral ligament? Absolutely. Correct. It's always, these patients have a rotational contracture. And obviously, the main reason we do this is pain control, but uh, improving range of motion is critical. Now I'm going to peel the capsule off. So if you did the osteotomy without the capsulectomy, you would have done this in one layer, but I've right. dissected the layer out. Now I'm peeling this off. So all you, the error here is to not go distal enough. You see how from the inferior aspect of the humerus, I'm down all the way to the top of the pec. It can be a couple, it's just a couple centimeters. Even if I get into the lat or pec a tiny bit, I'm okay with that. The error is to do too little of this. And there's a study out of Columbia that shows that uh, the humeral insertion of the Inferior capsule is highly variable and can extend way down on the metaphysis. So for that reason, really skeletonize that part to make sure that you release that capsule fully. Again, that's going to help with your glenoid exposure and your uh, post-op range of motion. Why your glenoid exposure? Because glenoid exposure is about humeral mobilization, right? Releasing that capsule to allow you to move the humerus out of the way. All right. And there you just put, you have one home in underneath the inferior neck one the joint and one kind of right behind the humeral head and you're doing your releases in order to kind of lever it out afterwards. Yeah, that's a good place to pause. So exactly as you said, with the two blunt homens, superiorly is called a Darrow retractor, which is Darrow. sort of a large um, kind of tongue depressor shaped type retractor. And then posteriorly is the brown deltoid retractor. This is kind of a retractor that kind of has like a spoon shape, 90 degree spoon on it that allows you to basically retract the deltoid and push the humerus. Um, you know, shoulder has some kind of unique retractors, but we use them every time. So <laughs> these blunt homans, these Dara's, these um, Cobels, Bakudas, brown deltoids, these are things you should become familiar with and they really can make the exposure much easier. Okay. You see this, this patient had a very unusual, like a very central arthritic defect. It was full thickness. Yeah, right the here. was uh, preserved. That's also something we've, published about Dr. Diane Little at Purdue University has really put this on the map. But basically what we think happens is people get stiff. When they get stiff, they only articulate with the mid part of the humerus, right? And the rest right. of the cartilage is preserved. And then they get stiffer and they get more arthritis and they get stiffer and they get more arthritis. And what you end up with is like this full thickness defect in the middle. And then the rest of the cartilage is normal because they haven't articulated with that for years. So it's a, a weird phenomenon in the shoulder that we see um, that, that, that are published about with Dr. Little that, um, you know, may have some implications for different alternative procedures, you know, graphs and partial replacements and that kind of thing. So. Well, I think that was awesome. I think we went through yeah. all the, uh, major steps, we went through the dissection, um, things to know it about on your approach. Of course, you, you know, you make your incision, uh, you cauterize all the bleeders, you make sure you're heading towards the, uh, delta pectoral interview and not too lateral. Um, you freed up the vein, you, uh, you, uh, bovied the feeders coming to the vein. You found kind of that delta pectoral interview interval and use your cobs to kind of sweep the, uh, the pec, um, and develop that interval more. You popped a, a home in over the, over the, uh, humeral shaft. You were able to find the CA ligament then with your cob. And then you put a home in over the, uh, over the cob. 
um, and then, you know, found your identify the clavicular pectoral fascia. We noted that the, the, the muscular part of the short head of the biceps, that's actually the more lateral part. You don't want to, you don't want to go medial. <laughs> you don't want to go more medial to that. Um, and you made your incision through there. Uh, and we developed that space, cauterized the bleeders for our three sisters, or our anterior humeral cir circumflex vessels. Um, we did our biceps tenodesis. So you found the sheath went straight down with the bovi and then did your tuberosity or just tuberosity osteotomy. And afterwards, uh, dissected out the two layers between the capsule and the subscapularis. Then that's then did a capsulectomy and uh, did our releases. You made sure we got inferior enough, and then you're able to dislocate it. And then next is on to a glenoid exposure, which is something different. But anyways, we talked about all the high points for um, delta pec approach for the shoulder. Uh, anything else that you think that is just important to know about? Because you know, we have a lot of residents, we have some fellows that will watch this just to understand the approach. Uh, anything else that you think they need to know about this approach? Well, uh, pardon the pun, but I think you nailed it. That's, uh, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I think the key is like anything else in, 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 uh, in orthopedics, you just got to know your anatomy, the anatomy of this approach. It's beautiful. I mean, I honestly, that's yeah. why I fell in love with shoulders. First time I did one of these at a resident, I thought this is oh, so much anatomy in here and I'm seeing all this stuff and it's, it's so, um, you can get quite, quite good and quite facile with this approach and really do a lot of things. So um, I think the key thing is uh, I would try to learn to kind of palpate that axillary nerve because that's really the structure oh, yes. that if you cut that, you burned all the bridges. So yeah. um, when you get good identifying that, that, you know, knowledge is power, right? And that allows you to do, to be very aggressive with clonid exposure and releases and things, um, but do it in a safe way. You mentioned the capsulectomy and I actually didn't cut out the tissue totally. That happens okay. later. So after I'd make my head cut and then I would put in my glenoid retractors, I would remove the tissue from the body at that point. And we can do another glenoid exposure video at a later date, but, good. but uh, yeah, this is, this is how we do a total shoulder for, as you said, for a fracture, um, we wouldn't do the, uh, we wouldn't do the three sisters. We would only do the uh, biceps if, if we thought it was necessary. But other than that, it's, the same, the same approach essentially in every way. So, well, Dr. Gergu, we appreciate your time for coming on and uh, teaching us and uh, going through this approach and, and, you know, sharing this video with us. Uh, thank you again so much. Uh, and we hope to have you back soon and, and hopefully we'll talk some glenoid exposure at that time. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd love for Will people do. if they have questions to ask me um, and hopefully we can start a conversation about this. Okay.